welcome to the Women Ways podcast. We have got a couple of guests on. We've got a couple of wonderful ladies. Lucy Heath, uh, who's been doing some amazing things. Hello. Um, what have you been up to, Lucy? Oh my gosh, so many things. I made pancakes <laughs> this morning. <laughs> I've been learning to bake. Um, I've been writing a lot. I've just shot a short film just before we went into second lockdown. Third lockdown, Jesus. Third lockdown. And now I'm turning that into a series. So I'm working on this. I'm doing research at the minute for my series that I'm I'm writing. So that's what I'm up to. We've also got Precious Badder on here, um, who's also an avid writer and actress. So tell us about yourself, Precious. I like to write like different types of scripts and um, hopefully try to produce my own um, work one day. Wicked. And you're with the Girls Network, who uh, we have Nat on here, who works with the Girls Network. Tell us what you've been up to. Yeah, so... Um... I'm head of communications at the Girls Network, but I've actually been with the charity for about five years. Um, And before looking at all our national comms, I was actually running our London mentoring program. And that's when I first got connected with Precious, who was one of our mentees and is now one of our ambassadors. So all our mentees graduate from the program after their year of mentoring and they become lifelong ambassadors of the Girls Network. And so Precious wasn't my mentee, but we were introduced by my colleague because I remember like my colleague talked to me. She's like, you have to. So my background is in theatre, I should say. So before the Girls Network, I was working in theatre and film and studied theatre for a long time. And um, my colleague said, there's this girl, you have to meet her. Her name's Precious. She writes, she really wants to talk to you about theatre. And she's obviously done the same thing with Precious. And we kind of, at one point at an event, someone was like, are you Nat? I was like, are you Precious? And it was just like, <laughs> oh, erup- eruption of like, I'm so happy to meet you. Um, and then we started just going for hot chocolates and talking about uh, writing. And I f- discovered that, Precious is a prolific writer. Mm. That's, that's, yeah, but uh, the Girls Network, we've been really busy and are kind of always meeting really inspiring young women. Is there a thousand girls every year? Is that right? Yeah, that's about right. Okay. Wow. wow. So that's really cool that you're able to kind of, I guess it gives everyone such a wide range of things that people are into. So there's always going to be someone that you can have the similar interests with or someone that you're able to connect to. Definitely. And with you, it's writing. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, that's Aww. great. Well done, Precious, as well. Like, Lucy, do you find it hard writing? Yeah, it's so it's super hard. It's super hard. It's funny, people always say, like, what do you prefer, writing or acting? And I think there's such different... You get s- such different things from them because with acting, it's like immediate satisfaction. It's mm-hmm. fun in the moment. Like, it's, it's just thrilling. With writing, it's so difficult and it's so arduous and you, you really have to, like put your whole time and effort into it but once it's finished it's so fulfilling and there's a certain level of fulfillment that I probably get from writing that I don't get from acting but it's just it's not you just don't get that gratification it's it's a slog like it's such hard work but but then once you work something out there's like a sense of euphoria Mm -hmm. that you that you probably only have when you like come off of after like a major performance on stage sort of thing there's like just a great I don't know if you guys find this with writing but once you've like if you've re- mm. been really stuck on on something and then you figure it out it's just so satisfying that it's a really like wonderful feeling what's your process with it like have you got a specific way of starting or have you got like your own little system I think like what I always have to do is I have to like spew every idea so I so I just literally write everything it doesn't have to be coherent it doesn't add up in any capacity I just write everything and I'll spend a few days writing every single thought out and then kind of for me once I have things on paper then I can decide from seeing it in front of me what route I'm going to go down or what is interesting and what isn't interesting especially when you come back to it a few days later the things that are interesting you'll inevitably remember whereas yeah. like the things that are a bit shit you won't so you just sort of that, and then that's always my starting point and then I'll refine and refine and refine and then I'll start writing but but now that I've never written a series before so now it's like so much research at the beginning whereas mm-hmm. usually I research alongside writing whereas now I feel like I need to do all the research at the beginning so that I'm not mm-hmm 
like because because with the series there's so much to write I don't want to get lost halfway through and be like where am I going with this so I think for for this particular process I'm planning way more than I have ever like planned before I think but I'll always write exposition like I'll write what their the the characters are thinking like I really like you I'll write all the exposition and their thoughts and then Mm. and then I'll take all that away and write dialogue and then I'll and then I'll take all that away and try and write the least amount of dialogue possible Mm. and the most amount of like humor possible so the humor and the action like will be the last step for me okay so is this are you making a comedy series yeah this is yeah yeah it's like a rom com series yeah and this is the one called Pragma is that mm-hmm. the one you're the short you... is Pragma yeah I'd really recommend Precious if you want you said you want to like produce your work Kickstarter is a really brilliant way of, of doing and we like exceeded our expectations and especially at the minute people are feeling particularly generous I think because they know how hard it is because f- film funds aren't really a thing at the minute they've all closed because of corona so Kickstarter is like a really good way to go we had so many strangers come wow. on board and give us like like a grand each and because they just wanted to be an exec producer on the project and that that was the reward we gave them was if you give us a thousand pounds you can be an exec and I think we had like eight strangers do that just yeah and what is like for someone who's never say someone's never heard of Kickstarter before what sure. would you say it is and like how did you get into it so Kickstarter is the same as like crowdfunder and it's basically an online platform where you advertise your project so we made a little video um using like footage from other uh, materials obviously we hadn't shot it yet just as like inspiration and then we wrote our like synopsis out we wrote about like us as people why we want to make the project and essentially you're pitching on a public platform to everyone like why they should give you money to make your project and why it's important and why it's exciting and then what we did was offer a lot of rewards ranging from an exec producer if you offer if they pay a grand I think all the way down to like a shout out if you give a tenor and then in the middle bit it would be like um you get a a signed copy of the script for like a hundred quid like those so different like Mm. reward and that worked really well actually Mm. to be fair have you thought of producing any of your work yet precious no, not really. I feel like um, I'm more like I actually want to be in it as well. Mm. So I wrote a script. It's called yeah. The Truth. Um, there's this character, Eliza. She's trying to find her way around, like the around her friends and how. Um, obviously, she lost her best friend, and um, she's trying to kind of find her way around what who she is as a person. Trying to look for her parents, but can't find them. And it's just, it's a lot going through. And I feel like I relate to her in a sense that she feels like she has to work hard for everything, but nobody ever sees that. And I feel like Mm. that's the kind of person I relate to in a way that I feel like I work hard for everything, Mm. but it's just never noticed. So I just, that's why I'm very shy. I shy away from a lot of things, if you get what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And and writing can be such a a vessel, I think, Mm -hmm. for people that, that shy away from mm. things because sometimes we're talking about a script as a series and sometimes we're talking about a feature film and sometimes we're talking about I know you're really interested in in plays and writing for theatre as well so I don't know maybe a question for Lucy around how do you know what you're writing for if are you writing for this big screen and small screen um the the stage how do you know when you're when you have an idea yeah, that is a good question. Do you know what? My answer is going to be really unsatisfying because essentially I write so I can act. So I'm like, what can I actually put, like, get made? In my head, a play is way harder to get made because it's like, I think you need far more funding. So the reason I'm making short films is so that I have a portfolio behind me to then make, like, this series. And, I, and I'm just about mm. to write my first feature as well. But it was sort of like... Um, I, I'm a bit cynical in that I think when I come to writing I think quite like business like and I think what can I actually get made what will progress um, like my career in what capacity so if there's something that if there's something that's like set in space or whatever 
that you're never going to be able to afford to make mm-hmm. at this stage of your career as a feature, then put it as a play because you can afford to do that. Like, I tend to think um, end goal when I come up with an idea and I'll be like, right, if I'm going to make this a short, then I'll I'll try and set it in like as little locations as possible. Or if I'm going to make this, you know, a, a crazy dystopian thing, then maybe I'll make it a play because I can afford that so it's it's yeah. kind of less about the idea and more about what I think I'll actually be able to because I lose interest personally I lose interest if I don't think it's going to get made when you're um about to write like a play or write a script what goes through your mind because with me when I'm thinking of something I have so much ideas I try to jog them down but I just don't know mm-hmm. how to start it or where to where it goes and stuff so when I'm writing it I sometimes rush it and then when I go back over it, I'm just like, oh, I don't like this. So what mm-hmm. advice would you have for me or for anyone who's trying to write their mm-hmm. own thing but trying to structure? Because what I struggle with a lot, you can even ask Nat when she reads my work, is um, obviously structure. Because she always tells me to start from like, the beginning, middle and end. But me, I have so much ideas. Mm. I just don't know how to like put them. So it becomes uh, too much. Mm-hmm. So what would you do? I would say on a sort of tangent, you should definitely apply for like the Soho Theatre Writing Course or one of those theatre writing courses because they really help with that specific problem. So I did the Soho Theatre one and they gave me like, I think specific tools. They almost feel like cheating in this weird way where you, if you're like, if I follow this structure, it feels boring, but you have to follow the structure to then make it interesting. So I think... It sounds like you've got so many ideas, which is amazing. So maybe the, the like craft you need to hone is learning about structure. Like you need to know that, you know, a fifth of the way into your plot an inciting incident happens. Like that's a boring thing to think about, but that is what will hook an audience. And you can, you can like sprinkle your ideas, but essentially this is such a wanky metaphor, but it's like you need the main ingredients to make the cake in the first place so maybe try and like if if you're also I'd say on another note if you're looking back and you're like this is rubbish is it rubbish because it's so early on because everything's rubbish early on like everything so don't dismiss something because it doesn't look like a final thing just look at it and be like what is good from it let me keep that let me get rid of whatever's like rubbish I I draft things I'd say I I, before I shoot anything I'm on about draft 20 to 25 like I redraft over and over and over because I'm not the first thing I write is crap like I absolutely have to redraft it's never good so I think look back show it to people show it to your friends and be like what of this random like spew of words did you find exciting and then and then you know take from that what you what they find exciting what you find exciting but I would say it would be really helpful for you to maybe like go to a class or read a book there's loads of books you can get for cheap just just on basic structure that's what I did when I was like first of all begin oh you've got a book yeah perfect but but like just copy it like just while you're learning just literally copy what they say and then what what how you'll make it different is the finishing touches is like the exciting bit probably structure wise it's unlikely at this stage that you would want to make it any diff i i would never feel brave enough to completely like disregard structure at this stage of my career <laughs> if you i read that um <laughs> michaela cole wrote 191 drafts of i may destroy you wow. so the one that we saw yeah. for anyone who watched yeah. it was the 191st that's crazy wow the first was probably terrible <laughs> that's like it. Yeah. and the, the yeah. 191st is incredible yeah. so you yeah. just have to keep like going and going and going until you get there it i may- heard that she i don't know how true this is i think it was in an interview but i mm. heard that she like when she was writing it she went to like this forest and like yeah. kept her phone off for like three weeks mm. focused on writing because mm. she was just so in it yeah mm. well it was a it was a true experience wasn't it it was like an experience she'd mm. been through so I reckon it would probably been so, some sort of therapy writing it for her because yeah. that was a that was a difficult story to tell and really was. also at points to watch because Obviously, it was so truthful. I think that's why it was so, like, well-received, was because everyone that, like, spoke about it said the same thing, which is, like, it was amazing, but 
it was so hard to watch, which is a sign of a really good piece of film or series because mm. it really makes you feel yeah. something. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I saw a quote once that said, distraction is the death of creativity. And I think when you're writing, that's such a good thing to remember. Like you saying mm. she went away for three weeks. Like I know that if I'm distracted by my phone, then whatever mm. I write is nonsense. But I thought Definitely. that's like, distraction is the death of creativity is a really good one to remember if you were like in a writing zone. Definitely. Yeah. Do you all have a yeah. favorite TV series? It's a big question. Oh, there's so many. <laughs> so many. Mm. Maybe Black Mirror for me. Used used oh, to be yeah. definitely early stages. That was up there for me. Black Mirror. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, Lucy, you've just made a film, haven't you? I have, guys. I have. <laughs> it's called Better. It's on Channel Four, isn't it? Channel Four. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's kind of Black Mirror esque, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, yeah, when I was first writing, Black Mirror was a real inspiration. I love like what if scenarios. Ten, oh my, and the same in this rom com that I'm writing now. Like, mm. it's still a what if this existed. Like, Brand's seen it. It's like a mm. like a what if this world existed scenario. I love all that. But yeah, a young mum whose son is being really badly bullied for being like overtly effeminate for a boy and in this world a new medical facility has opened up mm. where you can alter personality and she's faced the mum is faced with the question as to whether she should heteronormalize her son um in inverted commas um in order to like save him from his bullies so it's sort of a question of like it's it's a question of like a how far would you go to like protect the people you love but mm. b like where is the strength in just being who you are and not conforming it's that kind of like narrative i i suppose i like the i'm not obviously not to give too much of it away for anyone that hasn't seen it but like what i really love about it and what is so black mirror-esque about it is like the end kind of leaves you thinking it's so good it's a very it it made me cry slightly at the end i was like i'm excited to watch it now oh thanks guys how do you come up with other characters so like do you ever base them on real people that you know or do you just come up with them completely from scratch that's a question to all with me my first time writing a script I kind of I was I'm a very observant person so I look at little things that people don't notice so people always think that I'm weird because I look at little things people don't notice (laughs) like there's this character Amelia remember um, that from the first the first script She's the type of girl, she's that, she's quite intuitive, like she knows a lot of things, but she just doesn't know how to bring it out to people. And I have a friend that's like that as well. She knows a lot, she's really intelligent, but to bring it out, so she has so much thoughts going through her head, so much things, but to bring it out is more like, she doesn't know how to do it. Mm. So you kind of have to push her for her to say or for her to go through it so the first time I was writing I kind of did base some of my characters not all but some of my characters among the people I'm with yeah but then the second script it was just more like Mm. what goes on in everyday life and just you know Mm. yeah Mm. Luce um I don't know I always think I come up with like an original character and then as I get further down the line I'm like oh you're that person like <laughs> you're my mum usually um, like it's like it, I think I definitely I rarely go this is you but I definitely amalgamate people that I know or if it's like more of a stock character just for like comedy purposes it'll probably be based on someone I know less well so someone that I've met once maybe and then like an essence they had that I found funny or that I found peculiar like I might write into but yeah often often, I don't think it from the beginning I'm not like oh let me include you let me include you but as I go on I then probably realize that Mm. I've I've copied Mm. rather than Yeah. yeah I think it's it's definitely a, a skill and I think what you said earlier Lucy is so valid around like 
structuring a play for example or a film it, it's a it's a technique it's like there's a way to build a table and you can teach someone who wants to become a carpenter there's a way to structure a, a piece of work and you can teach that and practice it and I think with character work it's similar I think it helps initially to have a bit of like yeah something you've maybe noticed in someone or or like the worst thing you think about yourself like mm. grow that into a character <laughs> I, I quite like that um, <laughs> and but then from that you can you can be quite methodical about building on that so I remember on a course that I I took that I found really helpful and playwriting course um we had to we had to kind of make a wardrobe like a cupboard for each character with paper just like folding paper and then you you had to write kind of the characteristics that anyone even maybe just walking down the street would see of them so their mm. gait or how they look and that would go on the front doors and then you'd open it and you'd have the things that maybe people closer to them would know. Maybe like, you know, they get angry when they're hungry or something and that would be in the inside of the doors. And then there'd be like, well, I drew some three-dimensional shelves into mine, which was um, <laughs> impressed a lot of people. Um, <laughs> but basically on the actual, like in the middle bit, you'd have the things that maybe they don't even know about themselves, but, you know, those kind of more deeply rooted like nature things. And having that, I mean, if you can have that for all your characters even the ones that only appear in one scene or whatever you you really start to you know as you say at, at the end maybe when you're adding a bit of detail and a bit of depth you can kind of make you double check and make sure that those things are the characters are being true to themselves and I think yeah I I can only imagine I don't know if I was on my 191st draft that I'd have that <laughs> down and that it would really come across in the writing yeah. hopefully I also think sometimes characters can just represent a like for me they can like represent a narrative that's in society today and sometimes I watch that a lot in like I May Destroy is a great example where it's like these these represent a, a narrative I think like I, I in something I'm writing now I really want to explore this like um gay female character who's like super woke but therefore like enforcing all her opinions on everyone else and her wokeness in inverted commas essentially becomes oppression because it's like she's mm -hmm. like forcing her ideas on everyone mm -hmm. but even though they're in, in the in the idea of liberalism but she's still and I think for me like she sort of represents uh, space in like I don't know who she is person wise but she represents a space in society today that I think we spoke about before Brian where sometimes like even though I'm a liberal I'm, I'm very left wing sometimes liberalism becomes oppression because we're like you must think the way we think all the time or you're bad and therefore mm. that is then you know the opposite so sometimes I think characters can come out of of, com of narratives I see on social media that I find like ironic or that I think maybe are, if, if we were to sit down and like talk about it would would actually be a really silly character, but we're, but you get like wrapped up in the hype of things kind of thing. Yeah. Do, do you struggle with like creating settings? Because what I struggle with is that when I'm writing the script, I have the picture in my head. My problem is to jot it down. I don't know how to bring it to life. That's what I struggle with. Because I have so much ideas of how I want this setting to look like, this area to look like, this mm -hmm. how the bedroom is supposed to look like. But for me to jot it down mm -hmm. on paper, it's like, it's a big struggle. So I struggle with that a lot. I don't know if you struggle with that. I struggle in that I over explain because I want it to be a certain way. But you kind of have to remember you're not the director. And so my first drafts are always like paragraphs of what I want it to look like. And then I have to strip it back to the, to the essence. So I'd say if you're, if you're saying you want your bed to the left and did it like all of that, that's kind of really unnecessary. You'd be better off just saying like, like her items are a representation of her emotions strewn across the room do you know what I mean something that's like you just give a sentence that depicts like she's messy because her thoughts are messy you know even just saying that like she's a messy girl it, like um metaphorically and literally speaking something that is the director can then run with unless you would like to direct it something that you give like an essence and a vibe I think to the director and then they kind of take that with me like like because the first what the first of the um script i wrote though like 
all about sports. So when I think about the change room, I just say change room, then a change room. So I don't kind of describe how the change room is, but I feel like in my mind, I feel like no, I'm me- I'm meant to describe how the change room looks like, what it's look and um, what how the setting looks like, the color of the change room. Literally, I always have to think that, but I don't think I'm meant to write that. So I kind of struggle with like how mm. to I don't know what exactly to how, write. How do you want them to feel in that changing room? Like what is the in that changing room, are they feeling like isolated? Are they excited? Are they feeling, are they wealthy kids? Like what, what is it that you want us to take away from it? If it, if it's that it's like they're feeling lonely, like lonely teenage girls, then like you might write a really stark dressing room where there's no warmth and you don't need to write, you know, it, you know, like I said, like to the left we have da da da, but you can write like steely cold colours. If the if the feel you want us to feel is that they are like sad or lonely or whatever, then like steely cold colours and a like a sparse, like not much stuff in there is quite helpful to help like emulate that feeling. But if you want it to be like this is where the girls finally get to let loose and finally get to be themselves, then you can make it again you can you can say that like you don't have to detail what it looks like you can just say the vibe like the dressing room is sorry the changing room is the one place that feels like home to these girls like that could be your whole sentence and then your set designer will be like I know because we're not you know we're not set designers like there's there's a whole industry for that and and trust that if you say this place needs to feel like home these really talented set designers will come along and make a changing room that feels like home so maybe take the pressure off yourself I guess is I try to make them say how they're feeling mm-hmm. for it to create a facade around the whole atmosphere instead of me actually saying, oh, the room looks cold or the person is like that. So I don't know why my mindset is like that. I don't know. Have you read, like, I know that um, BBC have a lot of, like, back room, like, mm. stock room um, scripts that you can read mm. to have a look at how other people do it. Because um, I, when I was writing back when, when, um, I... <laughs> before she was a um, star, darling. <laughs> before I got into to the acting world. Um, <laughs> I, um, I know that when I was writing, I would use some of those and, and see how, they, how other people did it and how they managed to get theirs produced into the world because obviously... I would do the same as Lucy would. I'd be like, oh yeah, there would be a living room with a massive sofa that goes all the way around the room and you could run across it and there would be a thing and blah, blah, blah. Because as an actor, I think I would be like, I can't vision this right now. So I'm like writing all of it. And I think also, Precious, you're a right, you're an actress as well. Mm. So maybe it's because you're you're trying to figure out what it would look like so that you could be the actress going into that room and find that actor out. Oh, yeah. Okay, I get what you mean. Yeah. It's good to have that mind where you're thinking too much about everything because then you can strip it back, I guess, yeah. rather than not having enough. It's it sounds like you've you've got a really broad imagination, which is definitely a good thing to Agreed, have yeah. as a creative. One hundred percent. Maybe we can play a little game. We're all going to create a movie and I'll give you a plot and you can put in your actresses and your directors and stuff. Um, and then I'll tell you what the actual film is and who <laughs> is actually in the, in the movie. So um, the plot is Michelle Rodriguez stars as Diana Guzman, the product of a macho Brooklyn society that tells her she has no place in the boxing ring. Guzman sets out to prove them wrong in a hard-hitting but ultimately uplifting sports drama. Who would you put in it? Who would be your star of the show? Julia Peck. Do you know who that is? Julia Peck. Okay. Um, my producer is going to be Jason Morgan. Precious is on it. I know, but I'm like, what? Precious is like, know, on the phone. Like, <laughs> I'm like, get me Julia Peck on yesterday. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Oi, Jules. <laughs> Who else? I was gonna say Anna and um halfway, but then I realised she's not the like the sporting type. You never know. They can always <laughs> they can always uh 
train i'd love if anne hathaway listened to this and was like what <laughs> that's so mean <laughs> i think i'd put margot robbie really which is, a, which is a strange choice for a boxing mm. movie but i just feel like margot robbie is the type of actress that can just you know do anything yeah she was in i Tonya, actually which was kind of that was that's yeah cool. that was Obviously. wicked she was brilliant mm. wasn't she yeah, she was. Yeah. Do you know who I maybe? Um, I always say her name wrong, but is it Emma Mackey or oh, Emma Mackey? The uh, sex, sex education. education. Yeah, Emma Mackey. Mm. I feel like she'd be quite a good like. Mm. She's just very fiery, isn't she? Yeah, like, she'd be quite interesting to see. But again, she's, it's not like super athletic. But I guess she's just like like I just I'd be scared of her in the <laughs> ring. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you actually. I think I'll put Lily Jane. Oh, Lily Jane. Mm-hmm. Oh. She was in Fast Girls. There's this movie called Fast Girls and she was in it and she had to play the co-star uh. of another. If you get it's really it's a good movie. It's about it's like a it's kinda I got my first I got my inspiration for my first script. That was kind of like an inspiration to me for me to write oh, like yeah. athletics and then sports and drama and stuff. That's what that, I that's where I got my first inspiration really? from actually. I know who I'd put. Michaela Cole. Oh, Get her yeah. in. Defo Michaela Cole. Yeah. She'd probably write it as well. Yeah, exactly. And direct it. And produce it. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah. All your answers <laughs> in one. You're welcome. <laughs> so um, the the film was um, Girl Fight, which has Michelle Rodriguez oh, playing yeah. Diana Guzman. And it's kind of like Million Dollar Baby. So, Lucy, I know it's difficult, but, like, obviously when you're pitching stuff to people, so how did you, like, start the production company and then make it grow and create all these amazing things? Do you know what? That's, like, still... I guess I'm still in massive initial phases for that, and I am finding it quite, like, difficult to know where to go because it's that thing of when you have no like my production company we're making stuff and that's amazing but we as a company don't have money so what is tricky is like I can't employ anyone to help me I'd have to just ask people to help me (laughs) which you know feels a bit piss takey so you just kind of have to like do it all yourself and learn on the job and just go for coffees with as many people as you know that might be able to give you some advice on how to do it but it's, it's like real trial and error thing, I would say. Like I decided to set up the company because I wanted to like have all my work amalgamate to something like under an umbrella that could... Also, I'm so desperate to, you know, 10 years down the line be making features that like for me, I think could change the game for women and just representation across the board and like things that frustrate me about the industry. Like sort of a couple years ago, I decided to just stop ever getting upset about and instead I just went okay cool cool so one day I'll change it like what like one day let me work let me do this now let me put the foundations in so that one day all these things that I don't like about the industry I might be able to change for for other people so that was kind of the the dream and still is the dream but at the minute it's very much like I think my next stage is to find some money basically and then I think things will be able to pick up much quicker but hopefully with this next short it, it should be out in the next couple months because we've got some bigger names in it I'm hoping that with that then that might draw in some like money for future like we're using that as like a proof of concept to be like hey look we made this short with some like cool like actors in and stuff would you can give me your money and then <laughs> we can make like other stuff basically is is the dream but yeah it's sort of I'm massive early stages trial and error at the minute to be if I'm honest and t- tell us how is like tell us a little bit about your new new short I know it's not out yet mm-hmm. but can you give us like a, a an idea of what it's about yeah so it's like it's a rom-com a dystopian slash utopian depending which way you look at it like rom-com vibe um where once you graduate university you go straight to a partnering center where you're like algorithmically matched with your ideal mate and it's essentially like it's it's kind of the series will hopefully similar to sex education vibe where you see them in an education sense but you see them going through like you see them essentially it's a place where you're trained in love and it you take away like one of the lines in it is like you don't fall in love what we teach you not to fall in love but to step into love so it's about training people out of this romanticism of being like oh my god i just love him so much and now it's like it's meant to be like okay i 
the way I'm going to love you is like this and it's just like methodical Mm. and so it's like a it's like quite like strange Mm. and kooky kind of like humor I suppose that's the vibe I can definitely see that you've got that black mirror-esque to you and your writing yeah yeah you need to get Charlie Brooker on board yeah I know and then just like (laughs) use my name (laughs) yeah (laughs) he needs to freshen up a bit I think he (laughs) I think he'd be lucky yeah. to get involved. He, he needs Go me, on, what Charlie. Can I say? <laughs> Give her a call, Charlie. Yeah. If you were to meet any actresses or producers, who would it be? Question for everyone. Mine is Viola Davis. Mm. Viola Davis and Theo oh, Jones. That's a good one. Viola Davis. Such a good one. Viola yeah. Davis and I am obsessed with Viola Davis she and Theo Jones. Have you seen the new um, series she's done with Denzel Washington on um, Netflix where she's talking about, like, she's training actresses and actors, but it mm, looks no. amazing. Mm. She's, like, helping helping um, young men and women from underprivileged backgrounds and teaching them how to be confident and how to step out into the world. And, yeah. That's so cool. Because they've started their own production company. Oh, so. wow. Oh yeah, I think she's amazing. Mm. I'm, I'm an advocate for she. She is in Viola Davis, mm. but she was nominated for an Oscar for I haven't actually seen it, but it's called Doubt. But her screen time in the film was 20 minutes, and that's it. Wow. So she was nominated for an Oscar for mm. 20 minutes worth of acting, and I just think that is like that just says in itself how incredible she is. Didn't Judy Dench win the Oscar off an eight-minute performance? Yes. Oh, did she? In Victoria. <laughs> yeah, so... You just yeah. talked all over that one. Screw your fact, Branwen. <laughs> Try Judy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I always find... I absolutely love um, Patricia Clarkson. Mm. Yes, yeah, I find her so funny. What's she, what's she been in? So she's kind of known for... Um, she's been in House of Cards. She's been in Six Feet Under. Like She's oh. been in lots of like famous stuff. And she did um, Sharp Objects as well, which I haven't oh, actually I seen. See um, mm. She was in um, uh, the Woody Allen film, Whatever Works, as well. And she's just like... I don't know. She, she's just... I just find her just like quite exquisite to watch like she's mm. just like got class in her acting and she's so funny and yeah I just always like love to watch her and I, yeah I don't know what I'd say to her if I met her though. I need, to, <laughs> well, I need to prepare that <laughs> yeah I just you're exquisite I love watching like, you <laughs> step step back please madam <laughs> you'll just have cards of what you've written down <laughs> yeah um, no sorry this one isn't funny uh yeah I, yeah. I totally pa- I'd panic and mess it up but <laughs> I think she's great and now Michaela Cole definitely because oh, I have like yeah. a thousand bajillion questions about her process mm, and everything yeah. I mean I was gonna say Michaela Cole as well I reckon you need to get um, her on this podcast guys I know. come on yeah. this is like us hinting for her to come on yeah <laughs> If we mention her enough times, yeah. I reckon someone will hear it. Every episode. <laughs> yeah. Her Google <laughs> Analytics, like her Google Alerts will pick it up. Michaela Cole, Emma Stone is always a classic. Um, yeah. She's got um, Cruella coming out. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, really? I, I, I never that. saw her in that role, but like now I've seen the picture and stuff, I'm like, mm. well, okay. Maybe. She can do anything. I'm, I'm excited to see what she does with it because mm. it's such a wicked character. Mm. I think that J Lo is an amazing actress, yeah. and I think she's like oh, yeah. great in everything yeah. she's in. She is. She's different as well. Like she can do a lot of things on mm-hmm. top of like all the other music mm. stuff she can also do in like two languages. But as an actress, yeah, she's. I find her amazing. She's got that kind of yeah. look that's just yeah. so... When you watch her on screen, she's got so mm. much screen presence. I have always loved um, Natalie mm. Portman, but that's because I want to be her. So um, <laughs> I think... <laughs> um, I'm a big fan of Rachel Weiss mm. and I'm a big fan of uh, Rooney Mara. She's one of my faves. I just loved how she transformed herself yeah. in Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. She was so good in that. Lucy, what film would you say 
inspires you the most as a as a female? It's always stuff where she defies all like all odds. It's always stuff where she's like like put her focus on her work first and ignored all the no's. So it's not necessarily like for example, Joy, I'm not like that's the best film in the world. Have you seen Joy with yeah. um Jennifer Lawrence. Yeah, Jennifer Lawrence. I'm I'm not there like this is the best thing ever, but I just watch her character and I'm like, you just you just had tunnel vision and you ignored all the no's and I that kind of stuff. Even like me and my flatmate were watching Devil Wears Prada the other day and I was like, I think the message from this is meant to be like, you know, have a balanced life, work isn't everything. But the message I get from it is how can I be just like Meryl Streep and own everything? Like and I think so stuff like that where it's they've sort of gone like I think any yeah any films that are tunnel vision female characters that just focus on themselves because they're so incredibly rare I love Mm. those films so much Mm. what about you ladies how to get away with murder Viola Davis when oh yeah Annalise Keaton Annalise Keaton is such a powerful woman in an extent that when I was 10 years old and I was because now I'm 18 but this is the right when I was about 10 I think no when I was about 14 ish that's when I started watching um how to get over how to get away with murder and I saw one episode of um how to get away with murder and I was like who starts a lesson with how to get away with murder she says this is a criminal um, one, um, 100 I'm not going to be teaching you about da, 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 da. she said I'm going to be teaching you how to get with murder. I said, what? Who does that? <laughs> <laughs> Who comes in a classroom and says, I'm not going to be teaching about law. I'm going to be teaching how to get with murder. Well, it does say in the title, but... <laughs> <laughs> it does say in the title. And I was like, and I was like you know what? You and this woman, we're going to get along. Because she... I'm, I like more of like, <laughs> I like the twisted... I like like TV series that are twisted. They have like a... Not just the typical, I know what's going to happen next um, type of thing. I want to be on my feet. I want to know. I want to type a series whereby I'm just like, I don't know what's going to happen. You never know. It could be this. It could not be that. So I like the justification. And that's why I love The Vampire Diaries as well. Oh, my gosh. The best TV series ever. Yeah, I just, I, I love this. I just love Julie Plack. Like her work, her work is phenomenal originals the legacies all of those stuff i just i like supernatural mm-hmm. just basically it's just i feel like it's amazing nat who would your what film would you choose what film empowers you the most as a woman well this is a, a bit um of a kind of lateral choice but there's this drama documentary I don't, I don't know if you've seen it or heard of it it's called dreams of a life um and it's by carol morley and but it's got zoe Ashton in it um mm. I I never know how to properly say her name but she so it's kind of it's it's a real it's a real story um about a woman who you might have heard this in the headlines she was found in her flat in London basically a few years after she had died and no one had reported her missing in all that time and it's this really heartbreaking story and then and the documentary is kind of half recreating bits mm. of her life that Carol Morley was able to piece together with Zoe Ashton as as playing her but the reason why it empowers me and it kind of it just moves me so deeply because ultimately I don't want to kind of spoil it too much but basically it's the story of a woman that was it's a story of abuse and it's a story of 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 the things that so many women have to go through Mm. and it's just it, it just yeah just the the fact that she called it dreams of a life and the fact that by interviewing people that did love her and that were around her she kind of draws out what what happened to her it's just so I don't know it just makes me it empowers me because it reminds me that even though yes so many of us have to only dream of of a life because we're stopped in and we're blocked and we're held back and or we're killed um we still have storytelling and we still have each other um as women we'll we'll have that empathy for other women's stories so in that sense it's empowering so this is a bit of a downer but it's actually it's brilliant though it's just some you have to watch it because of just the skill the storytelling the research and the like emotion and sensitivity that's gone in it so Mm. um 
yeah, and I I admire Cara Morley a lot, and it makes she mm. you know she did a lot of her work kind of later in life. She works slowly, I think. Um, it, I don't know. I'm I'm always like inspired by people that have maybe only done a couple mm. of big things in their life because it makes me feel better about you know <laughs> <laughs> like I it's just it's so I think good things like take time and I yeah admire that uh, mm. yeah I admire that. <laughs> Have you guys ever seen, me and Alicia talked about this before when it when it came out, it was just incredible, um, The Morning Show. The, oh, just rewatched the, it, oh, so good. Wow, that, that series, like every single episode was just yeah. so moving. I think the way it's done is just incredible, the way they tell the story. What I really loved was the relationship between Jennifer Aniston and Reese Witherspoon's characters is that obviously at the beginning it was mm-hmm. like that competitiveness because yes. they're both powerful women in the working industry and it's almost like that thing where you're conditioned to be competitive with each other that's what men want women to uh, often not all yeah. men but often we're kind of socially conditioned to think if there's another successful woman then you should, should see her as a competitor but then obviously as they kind of developed and their relationship grew they become so much stronger together and I think that's what I really loved from that must have been quite like meta for Jennifer Aniston in terms of a lot of what her character goes through you imagine would have been a reality for her as well have you have you seen Cake with Jennifer Aniston no I've heard it I have heard she's amazing in it She's so, no one's ever seen it, but she's she's so brilliant in it and so different from Rachel. And I think it was her first, you know, she was like the rom-com era. Yeah, and I think it was her first like proper drama, mm-hmm. like post rom-com era. I'd really recommend it from like an acting perspective where I was honestly just mesmerized. I thought she was so, she, I think she's a brilliant actress anyways. I really rate her. Mm-hmm. But just as this character, I was like, wow, what a transformation out of mm-hmm. your norm. Like it was a real, like, you know, everyone calls like that McConaughey Hunt's, McConaughey or whatever it is Matthew McConaughey when he suddenly went to dramas and like whatever that word is I was like oh is this there is a her word version for that? yeah it's like the McConaughey or something where Matthew McConaughey <laughs> suddenly like switched from sort of like shitty teen rom-coms to like serious I think his first one was Dallas Buyers or okay. whatever it was first that was suddenly and then from that point on he did the shift and now has done like Oscar films ever since did he wow. call yeah, it himself the McConaughey probably <laughs> probably yeah, probably, yeah. <laughs> The Lucy Heath songs happening any minute. <laughs> and Ellen Pompeo, I feel like she's a powerful woman as well. Ellen Pompeo, did you, did you hear when she was talking about an interview how women in the industry are not being paid enough until she spoke up? In in 2015, she became the highest paying... Um, is it 2015 or 14? But she became the highest um, paid female actress in the world. Wow. And I felt like she kind of gave a voice to women to get paid the right amount they deserve mm-hmm. as well. So mm-hmm. I kind of look up to her as uh, mm. a person who speaks for women as well. Because I feel like in this industry, because they keep giving female the same characters to play, it kind of starts mm-hmm. It starts to make us audience feel like that's the only thing they're good at. But women, I feel like, were such yeah. like amazing beings that were not empowered enough i just wish what empowered mm-hmm. enough like there's so much there's so many actresses like nina dobrev to play four characters in one show is <laughs> yeah <laughs> is out of that was world. mental it, it was it, it was mental because and to show not only the different aspects of the characters not do you know when a person plays something you still see you mm. still see that okay they're still this person whereas she played these mm-hmm. different characters and it was shown that they're different characters not just the same person and i feel like that's what i like mm-hmm. about when females play the same um, play or the same person but play different characters to show that i can play this different characters until and, and still tell the mm-hmm. story in different ways and that's i just love it i love it i love it yeah mm-hmm. well this is this is what we're saying like um, a, a 3D female character is never usually yeah. written. So we need people like you, Precious least- and Lucy, to mm-hmm. make this happen. Change the world! <laughs> 
I listened to um, Phoebe Waller Bridge speak on something recently, and someone said to her, like, did you did you recognise that you were writing like the new feminist movement? Like, Fleabag was going to be such like a feminist movement as a character and she was like no 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 I wrote a female <laughs> like a real female who's flawed and complex mm-hmm. and like rounded and they see her as a feminist character because she doesn't like succumb to the the single structure yeah. character of like just being pretty or just being quiet or just being you know serving one purpose mm-hmm. and it's like so interesting because she is seen as like this like epitome of feminism but like wh- why because she's not out there being like equal rights you know that's not what her character does mm-hmm. at all her character just is a, a woman and that was like and I was like wow that's so funny that of course you didn't write her to be the poster child for feminism because she, because that's not at all what she is. Mm-hmm. She's just incredibly well-rounded and you see ugly sides of her, mm-hmm. which often we don't get to explore. Which yeah. I was like, wow, that's such an interesting, like, realisation. Yeah, and people so often misunderstand feminism in that way, don't they? And it almost like mm. they feel like it's also just too too much pressure when it's it's something that's quite simple and and in the arts especially is is just about representation it doesn't all have to it's not about characters educating you on it it's just about them being Mm -hmm. real as you say Mm -hmm. well thanks ladies for being on our podcast it was really nice having you you thank you thank you so much i really enjoyed it today yeah The Girls Network is currently looking for mentors in seven regions in England. Sussex, Portsmouth, Manchester, the West Midlands, Merseyside, the North East and Tees Valley and you can find out more and apply via the website. If you live in London there are opportunities for you to get involved as a mentor later in spring this year. All you have to do is sign up to the waiting list on their website and you'll be notified when applications reopen. You might also like to record a short video sharing your experience or advice or even do some fundraising. You can get all the latest updates by following them on their Twitter at TheGirlsNet or on Instagram at TheGirlsNetwork.